Ariana, Mbak Messi, um, Susan and Mas Firman, and you can come up. I think we have enough space. Yeah, so we minimize the traffic. Yeah, <laughs> see. Um, compared to Mas Deli, I always uh, say that you no. Know, while we're waiting for everybody to take their space, um, I always say that whenever we have an event with Smeru, I, I just feel so relaxed because all I have to do is come, sit, ask a few questions. <laughs> we were talking about that with Matiti because with the other partners of the Indonesia project, which shall not be named, <laughs> um, you will see me like bringing chairs, clearing tables, and doing heavy lifting. <laughs> <laughs> and I love all the other partners too. When even they're listening live right now, it's just a different experience. It's my point. So we're missing Uja. Um, yeah. While we wait for him, um, maybe uh, the first session would be a presentation by Ririn, and um, you can start the time as previous uh, presentations is ten minutes. Uh, sorry, 20 minutes. Yeah, so you can uh, start. Okay, so I'm presenting on behalf of my uh, co author, Dia Hadi Setionaluri, who cannot be here today since she's in her final week of pregnancy, which makes the topic of our current uh, paper all the more fitting. Um, so the driving question for our research is. Why do some women return to work while some others um, do not after they peak reproductive period? So this is a comparative age participation profile for women in Indonesia and in five other selected uh, countries. So you can see the M curve, which depicts women's uh, exit and re-entry into employment, is most pronounced in South Korea. In Sweden, which is the green line, uh, we chose Sweden here because uh, it's like a representative of countries in Scandinavia, which is arguably one of the leader in work family policies among OECD nations. The female participation profile is more of an inverted U shapes and closely resemble the typical male participation. In Indonesia, this one, female participation strangely peaks at the 45 to 49 age group. Now, there have been relatively little inquiries into the nature of women's employment interruption in Indonesia, the nature of the MCF. And my co-author's thesis actually uses data from the IFLS, where she looked at um, ever, work, ever work women with working history from 1996 to 2007, and she find that quite many had experienced employment interruption, and about half of the women who had employment breaks actually returned to their initial sectors. Now, one key empirical um, contribution from her study is the uh, finding that the likelihood to exit and to return is actually different across women uh, in different employment sectors to begin with and across women uh, uh, of different education spectrums. But we're still left with the question, the deeper question is actually why do these variations occur and what to do actually about it should the government would want to promote uh, the participation of married women uh, in employment in general. So we use a qualitative uh, micro-demographic research approach so we can probe deeper beyond the traditional uh, boundaries of measurable demographic correlates that shape women's employment uh, dynamics over the life course. And we choose to focus on uh, identifying contextual factors that drive women's employment variation in the Jakarta mega urban region. Why Jakarta? If you look at the figure, uh, figure two, uh, the, the left hand side on your side, uh, in Jakarta women in the 25 to 29 age group have the highest participation rate in 2015. But then participation seemed to just uh, 
fall off after that. There's a slight increase, but it didn't return to the previous um, uh, peak. So this is more closely resembled the situation in Singapore. Um, at the core of our theoretical framework, uh, our economics literature, believe it or not, uh, pointing to the asymmetric change um, in general. So these are the work of Paula England and Nancy Forb. So on the one hand, more and more women are engaged in market employment outside the home. But on the other hand, very little have changed in the way gender roles are happening within the family. So from a care-centered per perspective, as quoted by Nancy uh, Forb here, work-family conflicts arising from mother's time away from home can be conceptualized as the opportunity cost of working. Uh, so along this line, uh, McDonald um, also theorized that while clear progress has been made in gender equity in terms of schooling, access to jobs, you don't see much change in other social institutions like the family and in the state in the way they uh, provide care and through their tax transfer system. So in the face of such contradictions, you see countries, um, or ECD countries particularly, with low fertility levels. And women are pushed to either delay or opt out completely of motherhood. But the situation um, surrounding women work and the family is pretty different. That's what we want to argue in urban Indonesia. So first in Indonesia, despite the trend suggesting uh, delayed marriage or delayed entry into first birth, um, getting married and having children remain very much the universal ideals. So currently our TFR total fertility rate is about 2.4 and according to the 2012 Indonesian Demographic Health Survey, mean ideal number of children for women in urban Indonesia is about 2.6. So essentially, you don't really need to wait for surveyors from survey meters to knock on your door and ask, what is your ideal, uh, you know, when will you get married? When will you um, have your first child? When are you going to give a brother or little sister to your child? Because people around you will ask you those questions pretty much on a regular basis anyway. Um, uh, so. In addition to the prevailing ideals on marriage and having children, we refer to the literature, the second literature, on um, comparative welfare models about, um, about care pro provisions in different, uh, different countries, which subsequently would affect women's employment dynamics. Uh, in Indonesia, particularly in Greater Jakarta, the provision of care not only for children, but also for the elderly, falls within the family. It's a private matter of the family. Third, contextual factors. Ada apa dengan Jakarta? Female labor force participation in Indonesia is generally lower in urban than in rural areas. But uh, the existing literature uh, offer an explanation that is pretty vague. So they say, well, perhaps rural institutions are more friendly and more supportive of women to uh, combine work and employment than in um, urban areas. Um, so <laughs> taken together, so we're taking together these three dimensions. We want to know how women's family situation drive much of the variations in their opportunity cost of working. Right. I'm going to spend a little time here because this is a room full of economists. I don't have the slide for it. Um, so empirical work in economics uh, mostly centered how class-based resources affect the opportunity cost of not working. Right. That's in terms of foregone income. So the explanation is that women, uh, tertiary educated women, have higher opportunity costs of not working in terms of foregone income than women in uh, lower education status, but women at the lowest spectrum uh, have a higher need for income. This is a typical uh, uh, explanation in economist empirical work. But on the other side, 
I want to go uh, and adopt Nancy Forbes frame, frame, uh, framework and look at a care-centered argument um, and say that, well, there are care-centered uh, stories that are important in women's decision to work. Um, for example, to engage in uh, paid work, women have to uh, decide first and foremost, what is my support system? Can I go to work? Can I have uh, quality care of my child while I'm away? Now, there are class-based differences in the availability and the quality of alternative care for children. For example, migrant women from rural areas, they do not, they do not, cannot afford to pay nannies or babysitters, and you don't, they do not also live together with um, their parents or in-laws who can provide alternative care. Uh, uh, Class-based resources also uh, shape not only w whether women work or not, but where they work. Right. So higher educated women might have access to higher status job with a provision of maternity leave and better role compatibility. Now, our argument is like, if you look at this variation in the opportunity cost of working, um, you might actually get somewhere, particularly in cultures where having children and getting married is pretty important, and two, where the family plays a central role in the provision of care. And fertility rates remain above replacement. Uh, these are some of our research questions. Um, the, this particular research question is actually only for the current paper that we hope to send for a publication in a journal called um, Community Work and the Family. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> we don't think we'll get good reviews from the economists. Um, so we use a qualitative approach uh, to provide deeper insights into uh, women employment dynamics, and we argue that these are important uh, in our field, which is demography, because we want to identify uh, factors that we could build in into our theory about the dynamics between fertility and women's employment, and also in survey design in particular. So our um, objective is not to you know, come up with some sort of generalized uh, finding and argue that's apply, uh, applicable to everybody. So we, um, our data was collected through um, in-depth interviews with about uh, 30 uh, ever married women, um, from which eight were actually uh, focus group participants. Our sample is not random nor statistically representative, but we try to include ever married women uh, from different socioeconomic backgrounds with different uh, circumstances. So for example, two of our respondents are uh, were divorced or separated at the time of the interview. We also um, did interviews with employers and policymakers about eight key informants, but that's, they're not the focus of our discussion in the current paper. Um, the transcripts were written in Indonesian and we analyzed them using NVivo 11. Um, the, so these are, you might not be able to see it, but these are the coding map from NVivo. Most of the codes were determined previously through mobility issues, particularly with machet and with women's decision to exit employment because they have to relocate to a different municipality within Greater Jakarta. And the um, and specific, um, did I have it here? Anyway, specific workplace, workplace policies that prevent married couples from working together. So this is the result of an, a simple inquiry using World Cloud in NVivo. Now, what I want to highlight here is the differing narratives between the individual women interview as the supplier of labor on one hand and the employers and policymakers on the other. In the narratives about, um, sorry, in the narratives about women's labor force participation after marriage and motherhood, the women interview mostly articulate and identify reasons behind their decisions within 
the realm of their family situation, right? They weren't very demanding at all. They don't talk about the government didn't give them enough money and the, uh, the workplace was not very supportive and so on. So this is consistent with the macro context uh, in Indonesia where you don't have state provision of care. Uh, so the family has fast becoming the main site for tensions and negotiations, uh, negotiations for women's earning and caring roles. Um, in contrast, uh, the employers work uh, and family makers work cloud. You could see words like kebijakan, um, diskriminasi, uh, upah minimum, three month leave uh, around childbirth, which we know is hardly adequate given the much longer nature of uh, care required by children. Now, um, in the working paper, we organize our findings into three subsections. And here, I just want to focus on what's new. What's our contributions to the uh, international scholarship on women work and the family? Now, in the context where the care of uh, the children of working mothers are done in the private home, who can provide alternative care is important in women's work decision. Uh, conflicts and tensions because mother's time away from children is an opportunity cost of working but we found that the availability of a replacement trusted quality carer was important to look at predictor of women uh, um, return to the workforce and another related observation is that the timing aspect of employment exit. In demography, we only look at timing, particularly after first birth. But in our cases, we, we found uh, exit in higher order parity. Why do you have exit out of higher or in higher order parity after the third, ch third child? Well, uh, what we found was that it coincided with grandparents getting older. So the gra grandparents became too old and too frail uh, to, to look after the children. Mothering in the city, long commuting costs and um, travel costs, these add uh, additional opportunity costs working for the women, and these were experienced by women across social class. Uh, we actually found that uh, the strain from commuting induced exit not only after childbirth, but when the couples prepare to have children during uh, pregnancy because of complication as well. And mobility means that when women relocate after marriage, although the distance in terms of kilometers move uh, may not seem much, uh, it's actually uh, a really significant uh, predictor, uh, not predictor, a significant um, factor in their decision. Class-based resource sectors and workplace, Maternity leave, it turned out that for some women, particularly those with junior high school education and above, they don't want long maternity leave in the formal sector because they said uh, when they have cuti, when they're on mat leave, they only get their gaji poko. They don't get their uh, uang makan, apa ya? They don't get their per diem transport costs and so on. Whereas for the highly educated women, they complain that it's too short. Um, need for income effect and upward mobility was really important for women in the lower end of the education status, but we still identify that they switch to, um, to moral compatible uh, occupation. One more. Those with high opportunity costs, um, highly educated women, they didn't return to work, and we tried to find out why, and the reason was a lot of them felt nga enak. Uh, they can't perform well, and they don't feel uh, happy about it, and they don't feel bad for their colleagues. Um, we also found cases where there were specific work workplace regulation, including in a bank, a state-owned bank, that uh, prevent married couples to work together. And this, is, this had devastating impact on the long-term well-being of one of the women who eventually divorced from the husband. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, uh, maybe Angelina, you have about five minutes to show us, and then uh, yeah. <laughs> you can take one or two minutes for uh, questions from the floor.
Hi, uh, my name is Macy Angelina and I work for Mampu, a DFAT and Bapenas cooperation for uh, poverty reduction through women empowerment. And the reason why I introduce myself is to also say that I'm not an academic. So the context of my comment is really about how do I, as an implementer of a program like this, think about this paper that does provide a lot of information and new insights on how we look at the issue of women and employment. So first of all, I would like to say that I really appreciate the study because like what Ibu Indra Sari said, qualitative studies are supposed to tell stories and I really appreciate the narrative of care getting center stage and I'm sure feminist economists will all agree. And I also appreciate that the paper highlights the stories of women from different economic backgrounds. We could see women from um, lower economic backgrounds and social economic backgrounds think that, marital, uh, that, that maternal leave is too short. They also have more push to go back to formal sector employment compared to the others. Um, having said that, there are two things that I would like to say that would be really useful for the paper to elaborate on. And the first one is the need to get more information on the immediate context of the women in the study. So in order to tell a story, we need to know what surrounds the characters, right? So what does, what, what are the things that enable the women, especially from the higher class, to make the decisions that they make? What kind of household are they part in? What's the level of their household income? It, it, this is important because the lens is the opportunity cost of working, right? And working in a formal sector and not working in a formal sector doesn't necessarily mean that you forego income altogether because there are still opportunities to explore the informal sector. It would be interesting to find out more about what options do they have other than their old work in the formal sector. Do they have more opportunities and do they actually get more money by working in the informal sector like opening online shops or is such as the case in the paper, having some small home-owned business. So in order to really understand the opportunity cost, I think an analysis of the alternative that they're choosing and the package that comes with it would really help our understanding of the case. Uh, the second comment is on one of your most important findings, as you said, which is on the notion of trusted care. And this is important because lots of DFAT development programs like MAMPU, uh, COMPAC, or IPEC, the Economic Governance Program, we're looking into the probability of having a longer term child care as a way to facilitate women's entry to employment. But when you say that trusted care is what really matters, will providing a child care facility address the issue of having trusted child care? So from my own interest, it would be really good if the paper talks more about this notion of trusted child care and whether having a facility of child care will be able to tackle this concern. Yeah, five minutes. <laughs> But um, let's take one or two questions from the floor. Um, Ibu, <laughs> sociology, uh, and I guess Papa Econom. That represents the two. I'm sorry, you can ask privately. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, thank you. Very short questions. Who are the employers and policymakers? Are they women as well? Uh, yeah, um, I was thinking, if you, if me or not? Yes, you. Yeah. <laughs> Five <laughs> seconds. That's okay. <clears throat> if you think about different concepts of power, uh, so you think of is there's a, there's at least three concepts of power. So power as material, political economy, access to resources, control over resources power as embedded in institutions and the ways and means and formal and informal rules and ways of doing things and power as embedded in discourse and thinking and the way people frame the way people police themselves i wonder how, which of those you you found most visible in your study um and where you could say a bit more about how you were thinking about power and that aspect of gender inequality thank you Maybe let's just uh, get around with this for uh, issues, questions, comments from the questions. Okay, so I'm going to. Um go to address Macy's comments. Thank you so much for the uh, really good comments, uh, Macy. Uh, yes, that's a really, really useful um, 
input for, for, for our paper, actually. We did have a, a short questionnaire that provided all the demographic characteristics of the women, including their household finances. And if you actually, um, I don't, I don't know whether I could go back to, um, to my slides, household finances, uh, we actually have a, a whole of transcript that were identified as enabling factor. Enabling factor not only in terms of resources, uh, husband's income, uh, also their assets, uh, their house where they live, um, uh, yeah, um, and, and what they do as well for their, uh, although they uh, they're at home, most of them. A lot of the women, particularly uh, the, the middle uh, women from the uh, uh, senior head education, senior high school education and below, um, always have some sort of small income generating activity. So I think what we'll do in the paper is we'll have a table as an appendix with um, with a summary of the women that who's um, um, who cite, uh, not only just those that we cited in the narratives here. So thank you so much for that input. In terms of trusted care, um, what we actually wrote in the, uh, in the conclusion chapter was that perhaps we really should consider about having a regulated and heavily subsidized, if not free, child care places in, in industrial areas where there are a lot of migrant wor women working in factory workers. Um, because this would uh, enable them to access work, but also be close to their children and have quality carers. So, some, uh, so it has to be tightly regulated. So, so qualified carers is a key. And um, perhaps this could be something for Jay Paul to fund whether uh, it's something to work, uh, that can work or not. So in such provision, what you're wanting to see is whether one, it will facilitate uh, help women to return to formal sector employment, if that's their wish. And two, it might also be an intervention in the outcome of the children, perhaps through providing nutrition and early childhood education. That's the first. My response to you. Uh, Ibu Indra, who are the employers and the policy makers? So we had eight. Uh, two employers, one male human resource manager for a manufacturing Korean shoe manufacturing company and a female human resource manager from a multinational accounting company. Uh, uh, we have another male um, uh, key informant. He's an owner of a small boutique communication company and he was a social media darling because he initiated a full uh, paid six months maternity leave last year. Um, but it was only possible because he had a small, <laughs> uh, a small, um, uh, company. The policy makers we interviewed, um, uh, a bunch of people. They were sitting in a forum in Kemenaker, in Apa? Uh, Kemenaker. Via yeah, Ministry of Employment, we interviewed one of the division head in uh, Menek Pepe, the Women um, Empowerment Ministry. Uh, we interviewed a policymaker, uh, a key, uh, from Bapanas, and she's female. And uh, we interviewed a male who was working for Ilo Odison Org as well. Um, I think that's. But I remember. And the different concept of power. Uh, I didn't have the time to talk about here. Uh, and it was about the power of the women within the home. Right. So that's a really important story because you come across. So I'm just going to read something. Um, uh, where was it? So in a lot of the interviews, they said, my husband requested. My husband felt sorry for me because I had to work long hours. Uh, I was working shift works in Plaza Senayan as a sales promotion girl, and I didn't get home till 1 p.m. So he felt sorry, and he said that I should just work be working from home. So there are these kind of stories. And, uh, and, and, and in a way, the women didn't really voice their um, decision as because my, my husband ordered me to do so. I think it was just the dynamics in um, decision making within the home. Um, one was saying, well, it was a mutual decision because it was hard for us to have a baby and my husband requested that I could take freelance freelance work uh, in drawing house plans from home, but he said that I shouldn't be too tired. 
So things like that. So those kind of power negotiations are happening uh, within the family. Um, so um, it's, a, it's an interesting story, but it's also something that's been repeatedly said in the Indonesian literature. We would mention it in, we did actually mention it in the working paper, but we didn't talk about it today. But yeah, looking from a power perspective, I think it's important. Thank you. We have a little uh, bit more time and I'm going to let the discussant, um, if you have some other points and also to uh, respond to some of the um, uh, answers. Okay. Um, first of all, on the trusted care notion, I think it's interesting that the paper says trust is when you know the people who are taking care of your children. So it's always grandparents or somebody else within the family that is trusted. So if the notion of trust is closely linked to family, will a government regulated with qualified carers facility be able to address that concern of trust? Because that's one of the biggest puzzle for people who are thinking about providing child care. So far, is there actually demand for child care? Is it in the form that people usually think of child care? So that's one of the puzzles that implementers in this space are thinking about. An um, additional comment might be on um, the women who are from the lower economic status and why don't they go back to the formal employment, even though mostly the people in your case, the subjects do choose to go back to formal employment. But the empirical experience of the women working with Mampu partners, which are women organizations that do community organizing and policy advocacy, shows that most of the poorer women prefer to work in the informal sector because it allows them to have a portfolio of activities and different means of income generation. If they choose to work in the formal sector, they have said before in our discussions that it's easy, they actually are put in a more vulnerable position because they can be let go anytime. It also uh, cuts down, it, it also includes a lot of costs with transportation, etc. So when they actually choose to go into the informal sector, they gain more than compared to if they work in the informal sector, the formal sector. Okay, thank you um, for excellent presentation and uh, this discussion um, and a round of applause for uh, both Biren and Macy. You are free to stay here or to return to your uh, seats, but um, let's go on to the next uh, topic, which is um, cell phones and something. Okay. <laughs> you, have, okay, you have 10 minutes. Uh, sorry, th 20 minutes for presentation. Okay, um, thanks all. Uh, I'm Susan Olivia from Monash University. Um, so I think that both the female and I, we are trained as economists, so we are going to do a division of labor. So I'm going to do most of the talking, and then you can direct all the hard questions to like Firman. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, I mean, we really are grateful for the opportunity of uh, this uh, through the AN Indonesia project that uh, through this project that we are able to do some collaborative work with the uh, uh, firm. So pretty much uh, this project, what we are going to do, we're just going to do another like, price survey experiment. Um, so that's quite a bit of mixed news. So that uh, we have been the, quite a change in title. So today that I'm going to like, uh, give you an uh, overview of our research proposal, like, partly because that there has been delay uh, from our project. And then I was having an unexpected surgery last year, so that's why that we need to like delay. And then uh, that's why rather than rushing through everything, so better just, just take uh, some time and then uh, plan everything. And then we are really grateful to Indonesia project, and then also like, SMRU have been very accommodating for these unexpected circumstances. Okay. Um, so that is enough said. So let me just give you like, some motivation about our project here. So let me like, start with a, a quote from this uh, Lauren Summers. So how many of you know who Lauren Summers? Okay, yeah. <laughs> not really sure that it's a religion or not, but uh, Lawrence Summer is uh, he's very well known the American economist, and then he has held quite a few important posts in the U.S. Uh, among of them is the uh, chief economist at the World Bank. So that is a nice quotation from uh, him here. There are no statistics more fundamental than the price statistics. So I think that we are all very agree on this point here. Price is very important, right? So every time when I go back to Indonesia, people complain, "Oh my gosh, price of like jabe has gone up by." 20%, 30%, right? So from economist's point of view here, we economists need good measure of prices to conduct studies for like many applications. So one of them is that, you know, try to like measure in poverty and also to like monitoring poverty over the time, right? So from that point of view, you know, you need to have a good prices. So you need to like make sure that the poverty lines corresponding to the change of the cost living of the poor because that, that's the people that who you are worried about here. 
And then apart from uh, uh, needing this good price data for um, the uh, estimating uh, poverty in here, we also like, need uh, this uh, price data to estimating the price elasticity either like for the trade policy analysis, or if you are doing some CG modeling, you need to like get what is the metric about your own price elasticity and the cross price elasticity. And then the other part as well, you also like need it to use it for the tax and the subsidy reform. So basically that in many developing countries, because that a lot of people are still involved in the informal sector, so that is no a good way government to try to like get a tax from the income sector. So that's why the government in developing countries, they heavily rely on this informal tax here. So that is what happened in Indonesia, I think, during the early 80s and 90s, we also have this uh, rice subsidy. So that is uh, one of the example of this indirect uh, tax subsidy reform and so forth in here. So, um, so I'm going to like, come back uh, in a few seconds in here is that uh, in the recent year, like, people like, try to use this uh, price policy to like, not to consume is a healthier choice, right? So, um, so will 2016 be the year of the like, SINT uh, soda tax? And then we come back in a few seconds, why uh, do we mean by that in here? So the other thing as well in here, apart from uh, what is being measured in here, we also like, need a price deflator for measuring real output and real income. So because that, uh, usually that people like, try to know that how the economy is performing in terms of like, real economic growth in here, we need to get a price deflator to adjust it for the nominal over the time in here. So basically that when like, people try to measure in this real output in here, they usually use the CPI as a price deflator. But unfortunately, that when people like try to using this CPI as a price deflator, there has been the evidence not only in the developing country, but also in the US and then Korea, Australia as well. So there has been an urban CPI bias. So give you the example that closer to the home and then to promote that, you know, uh, with my own work and my co-author. So we have a paper published in the BIES uh, three years ago. We actually found that uh, there is a CPI bias in the Indonesian context in here. So we found that the CPI bias is about a four percentage point here. So as a result, that when we try to look at the long-term comparison over the time, we see that you know, the government official statistics tend to understand the severe of the Asian financial crisis during that time here. So I'm not going to like, go through in detail, so you can just like, uh, read through uh, uh, that BIS if you're interested, try to look at this topic here. And then the other uh, 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 need for the price deflator is here, like, people also like, need it for, to adjust it for the monetary policy. And then also in some country, you're using this inflation as a way to adjusting the social welfare payment. So I'm not really sure whether that uh, adjusting social welfare payment in, that is uh, through the case for Indonesia or not. So some of the audience in here might be able to uh, give us uh, some uh, commenting on them here. So now that this is quite a troubling here because that we know that price is very important for many important analysis here, but not many studies actually like collect the price data or the use the good price data in here. Um, so let me like try to come back in here. So where do we usually get our data from? So the source of price data. So usually the main one in here is that the statistic agencies, many different countries, they collect this uh, consumer price data. So many that they collect this for the purpose of uh, computing this uh, monthly the CPI bias. But uh, the problem in here is that mainly most of this consumer price data, they only like using the collecting data from the urban area. So that's main, not many, I mean, uh, when I try to look at literature, even though in the U.S. context, they do not collect the data from the rural part of the U.S. in here, right? So in Indonesia, the case in here, I think that BPS has been like, doing quite a good job. So they has been like keep expanding the observation over the time. I think they're starting with only like 29 cities. So now up to the like, 82 cities in here. Um, so but the problem in here, that's only like mainly covered in the urban area. So there's nothing covered in the rural area. So that is quite a bit uh, troublesome in here. So, so without, with this reason in here, if you do not have the rural data, so when you like try to do a comparison, a rural a living standard of, um, uh, living standard in here, so you have to like use this a proxy for the urban price as a proxy for the, what the people in the rural area faces in here. But the problem in here is that the urban food price, they are actually a poor guide to the prices paid by the those in the rural area. Especially, probably if you're using this CPI for the purpose of measuring poverty. Again, that using the case for Indonesia here, uh, so I think that most of us in this room is uh, old enough to uh, remember about that Indonesia was hit by the Asian financial crisis. Um, so we don't have a rural price data, 
and that made it very reliable to measure inflation faced by the rural Indonesia during the financial crisis in here. So I think that's why the IBLS did a good job. So they have to like go to the field, did the extra, the module, like try to like collect this uh, price data and have to find out what is the extent of this uh, severe of the crisis faced by the rural household in here. And then also, um, uh, apart from this, urban food price is not a um, good guide to um, kind of proxy for the paid by in the rural area in here. In the many poor countries, we absolutely observe that the prices vary the most over the space due to could be like, you know, there's kind of missing market story or because they have bad infrastructure, they don't have a good enough infrastructure. I mean, the transportation costs might be quite expensive to get the good from a point A to the point B in a very remote area, or they might be have a poor marketing systems or they have kind of like your supply chains in here. So that might be quite a few um, things that we should need to be worried about. And then the other thing as well that mainly um, people use uh, another uh, price data is mainly from the unit value. So basically, that you know, if um, all of you in the room that you have used the household expenditure data, you know that even though they do not collect the price data, but they ask you that what is how much do you spend for this item, and then how much do you buy. So you can use the ratio of expenditure divided by the quantity as a proxy for the per unit prices. So that's pretty much what's been people using um, or, uh, along this uh, demand study here. But the problem in here, even though that unit value is a proxy for price, but technically it is not really a price, right? Because that this unit value reflects the quality differences chosen by household. So this is like pioneer work by the Angus Seaton who won the Nobel Prize in Economics last year. And then in his seminar paper that is, I think, published in Journal of Econometrics, he used the data from uh, Indonesia, Susanas, and then he also like, find you know, that is substantial bias if you are not adjusting for the quality in your estimating demand in here. Um, so what happened here is that when you try to use a unit value in here, when your price increase, so one of the adjustments in here, you can reduce your quantity, that is fine. But the other adjustment, you can also you know, pay the same amount, like, you know, same amount of expenditure, but you can also like, adjust the quality here. So for this example, instead of like buying the Angus steak or scotch filet, I can just like, downgrade quality to buying the minced beef in here. Right, so because that you know, so when you do not uh, take it into that uh, uh, into consideration in here, so you are going to like make the price elasticity like too big absolute value. So there's quite a few example in here. So like uh, my co like Gibson and Kim, so using the data for Vietnam in here, so they found that you know if you do not take into account this quality effect, the elasticity of the demand is about minus 0.3, and then when you like try to um, take account of quality, there's only about like 0.27 in here, right? So that is a quite a huge effect. So what is the effect in here? Is that the policy implication? So there has been a broad movement in many countries in favor of tax on unhealthy foods in here. So what we call as the sin goods here. So if you recall that the Mexico, I think a few years ago, they tried to introduce this um, food and sugary color tax, right? And then uh, uh, in a, I think a few weeks ago, the breed uh, in the UK, they're just going to announce that they're also like going to introduce the sugar tax or the soft drink. And then the Jamie Oliver advocate for, um, for this kind of healthy lifestyle, they also said the Australia should also follow the step in here, right? And then, um, so back to the home of Indonesia in here. So Indonesia government is going to like say they are going to like uh, increase the tax to about 11% for Indonesia. And then also that uh, after this uh, big movement by the UK government, so there are quite a few talk that Indonesia, India, Philippines is going to look to Levi to tackle obesity and diabetes in here. So the idea is quite good, right? So what happened in here is usually that people in the public health in here, they forgot they do not really take into account that this is a quality adjustment here, right? So that might be saying, you know, usually that when we look, try to look at literature in this effect, they say, okay, if you want to tackle obesity, just increase the tax by 30% or 40%, and they're going to have a reduction by certain amount or so in here. But the problem here, as I said, what I mentioned to you before, if we do not take into account the quality effect, probably that, you know, people might be able to adjust for the quality in here. So... So this is, the, I went to the Indomaret a few doors away from here. So this example for the cigarette. So, uh, so I mean, luckily that the bot didn't, uh, the bot at the counter like, did not like, notice me. I took a snap on uh, this uh, atomy here. So you see that this is just within the cigarette. So there's a lot of variation, a lot of uh, brand in here. So I think that what I can snap in here, so the price is ranged from about 23,000, uh, 29,000 is the most expensive one to about the 13,000 uh, 13, here. 
So as a result, in here, if like people, if you know, like government say we are going to increase the tax to make the people to reduce smoking, right? So what happening here is that some people might just like, stop buying the twenty nine thousand per pack, but they can also like adjust like, by buying the thirteen thousand uh, per pack in here. But the problem is that how do we know if the lower price in here that might be a uh, higher in the nicotine level? So that may be quite a bit uh, severe in here. Um, so the other problem with this uh, unit value in here is that unit value is only available for purchasing or consuming household. So like for us uh, who has been dealing with the household survey, we know that a lot of the time we have to like, deal with the missing value. We don't have the information for this household. So we have to do something about it as well. And then because that this unit values is expenditure of uh, ratio of expenditure and quantity in here, so they usually have this kind of reporting error both in expenditure and quantity. So from an econometric point of view, they might be kind of introduce this spurious correlation that we really need them um, to uh, going to even like, make the severe bias even at once. Yeah. Um, so the other problem in here is that unit value can only proxy for price if that uh, Higgsian separability assumption hold. So what this Higgsian separability assumption telling us in here is that usually when you're like, looking at the household price survey, they usually like, say, for example, like, within the rice, you have a lot of variety of rice. You have the like, balam, IR46, uh, Tisadene, uh, just Brasmapi, or whatever so forth in here. Usually the household survey, they just like, take like one price, specific price, as a proxy for that the overall group in here. So the unit value is going to like, work if that, that whatever that price being uh, choose from can be a good proxy for the other price. So i.e. I, I, that if the price for each variety within the group, they are a constant. But the problem in here is that, so there has been like, some work in the Vietnam in here, we found that there seems to be the price doesn't constant across the space in here. So this is an example for the price ratio of a high quality to low, low quality rice in Vietnam in here. So what uh, they show that here, there is a high quality rice, the, the area of surplus of rice in Vietnam is in the southern part of Vietnam. So as you move from the southern part to the Vietnam to the northern part of the Vietnam in here, so the price ratio of a high quality to low quality rice become like smaller and smaller. So that's partly because they're due to effect of the Archean Allen effect. So in that is saying that it's taking about like, you no, know, that's quite a possible because that with the Archean Allen effect is that you no, know, when you like try to including the shipping cost from this the southern part, the surplus of rice to the northern part of Vietnam in here, because that with the shipping cost, you can just like pay that per unit cost in here. So what happened here? So like the shipping cost, so that makes that the total cost of the high quality rice uh, relative to the low quality is it's become like cheaper and cheaper, right? Unless there, there is uh, some different adjustment in the quality, uh, in the transaction cost here. Um, so now that the problem is here, the price variation across space, the eight estimation of the elastic of demand, but we up to date, we haven't like, seen a lot of, um, um, a lot of like price data, especially in the remote area. So why this might be the case in here? So one of the possible reason is that maybe that the market may be way, way, way too remote for the survey team, right? So I think some of the people in here talking about this uh, Sulawesi or Papua, they might be like take forever for them to reach the area, so it might, mean, might be quite costly. So that might be one possible reason. And then the other time as well might be items are missing due to the low density of demand. So if you go to this developing country, some of the rural market, they do not meet every day. So they only like meet irregularly, then sometimes only like a few hours of the day here. So that might be uh, explaining why. Um, we uh, do not also be surprised. How am I doing with time? Okay. Okay. So that is where uh, how our objective of research coming in here. So we know that um, despite the importance of price, so we are quite frustrated in here. No high quality data on the price exists, uh, especially for the rural area here, right? So we know that the econometrics model, we might be able to like solve for this um, uh, account for the quality, quantity effect. But is that because, you know, maybe that if we have the good data available, we might not necessarily need the econometric technique at all, but who knows because that we don't have this a good price data, so we won't be able to like, tell what's going on here. Of course, that, you know, even though I have to admit that the like, people that are doing this econometrics, they have done quite a substantial work to like, try to improving this demand here. So in this project in here, we are going to overcome the urban bias price data collection. Um, so why are we going to do here? We are going to experimenting with a low cost way of gathering price and quality data in rural Indonesia using a smartphone and the crowdsourcing technology in here. Right, so hopefully that by using this novel method, how are we going to overcome this uh, price data collection is mainly in urban area. 
So Indonesia is an ideal setting because that is kind of like a big country and a huge variation over the space in the prices and what the consumer face in here. Um, so this is just kind of like some statistic, but it's going to like uh, gloss it over in here. So you see that you know, over the time in here, the internet penetration has like increased by about a seven for, for about less than 10 to about a 43%, right? So the case for Indonesia as well, so this from 2000 and 2014, you hardly see any household having a fixed phone line anymore, but the number of like mobile cell has been like increasing quite substantially as well. So that's why that made me quite the um, feasible for this project here. So the mobile phones for the economic development. Um, so the impact of mobile phone uh, to uh, understand this aspect of economic development uh, are increasingly studied here. So like one of the seminar paper by Robert Jensen, he found you know what happened if you like try to use the introduction of mobile phone in the fishing industry in Kerala, India, because that like, partly because that people the fishermen in the Kerala, India, they don't have enough information. So that's why you know they seem to be arbitrary and then they become excess supply, excess demand, and then they won't be able to use as a way to like clean the market, right? So there's been a waste. So when we try to introduce this technology here, so they found that expansion of mobile phone coverage is going to lead significant reduction in fees prices dispersion across market as well as declining in waste. So in other words, you know, with using this mobile phone, that means you know, making uh, to counter uh, to solve that the missing market information, make the information that more flow freely, and then people can like you know transact and then add um, accordingly in here. So I'm not going to like, go through in details because uh, in, in the interest of time. Um, so, but uh, despite there's quite a few studies, but they haven't been a lot of attention at trying to use this uh, crowdsourcing high frequency price data using a mobile phone here. So this uh, idea has been tried in the urban area developing country. But um, so what is the crowdsourcing in here? Instead of like, you sending a people to collect the data, you actually um, use the people in situ resident as a crowd to supply the data using the modern technology. So that is your cell phone in here. So that's what I did yesterday when I went to Indomaret so to do that uh, example in here. So this method is of course is going to be best applied areas where the traditional data method collection is difficult or costly due to a lack of geographic proximity. So if you like the, the further remote you are, probably that is the better you can do here. So we are going to planning to go to uh, Nusa Tenggara. So uh, we are going to uh, go uh, plan to go to the field in September. So Entebbe in here is quite interesting because that uh, one of the Indonesian pro, uh, poorest provinces and then it's a rural nature of province and then um, geographic cluster will compress exclusively or informal and then cash only market and store here. Um, so in this case, uh, we are also aware that there has been uh, some study by the UN Global Pass in here. Oh, hang on. So this is um, our proposed study site. So we're probably just going to like, go to this uh, Lombok area. So because that... Uh, oops. Okay, um, so I mean the plan of Hawaii here is going to like visit the 18 enumerators area in the NTB. So we also like uh, try to list it in the Susana sample. So if a budget permitting, of course, we are still like try to do calculation. If we can stretch a bit further, we are going to increase our sample, uh, sample size. But of course, in the audience, if you know anyone who is willing to like fund this project, so please let us know. And then we are still uh, looking, try to like go beyond the NTB here. So this is where we try to do. So ideally, that we want to try to like spread across this um, uh, Lombok island in here. So that's where that, what we want to like go. Um, so with the, this, I told you before that we are aware that this is a unique global post study. So they are just a step ahead from us. So um, so we just discovered their report that uh, last year in here. So they also like did a bit of crowdsourcing in here, but we are quite different from what they are doing here because that what the, this global past is more interested try to look at the price volatility. So they actually collect the data on the intraday uh, more like high frequency in here, but their purpose is quite different from ours in here. Um, so if you can see that most of their data is actually uh, sample is clustered around this uh, urban part of the Lombok area. So that might be the quite different. So what we are interested in because we are interested try to look at special variations, we like to let uh, samples going to be spread all different across in the NTAB here. And so what are we going to like, propose our price uh, survey experiment? So we are going to do uh, recruit the non-professional price collector as the crowd using a mobile phone to, um, uh, as a modern entity means for collecting price and quality data. So we're just going to like, uh, we also going to um, get them to collect the 40 foot or non-foot items. And then on a fourth monthly basis, we're going to like, try to collect the over the four month period. And then we will get them to like, send us the price data. 
uh, specification of that uh, in the weight of volume um, and then a specified item. And then we also um, going to, rather than using discovery mode, we are going to like tell the contributor, no, you need to go to this area and this area and so forth in here. And then whoever that we are going, uh, whoever that sent the price data, they're going to be rewarded with uh, mobile airtime in here. So we are just going to quite a few different ways. Um, um, I'm uh, going to Facebook group or maybe do a one-on-one -on -one training. And then we also have budgeted. We might want to like train some people in there in case they did not have access to the cell phone. And then we might give them a cell phone to do that as well. So just give me like one more uh, second. And then um, I will press experiment here. So there are quite a few things what we want to do here. So at the baseline, we also like want going to like send the enumerator. Um, this is survey meter team. We are going to like collect the price data at the various outlet which will be served as a reference prices. And then we also like collect the first information about our uh, crowdsource um, uh, MPC at the baseline. And then um, one of these low cost prices that are being collected, we will try to link with the Susanas to test with a few hypotheses in here. So that's why that we are going to like, go to the field in September because we know that Susanas, uh, they are going to uh, be fitted around September around that time. So ideally that to cut costs, we just want to link our, uh, set, uh, our data with the Susanas data. And then we try to look at what is the difference in the result for this uh, price of experiment here. So we, there are quite a few uh, papers that we are anticipating for here. We might want to come and know whether that rural poor faces higher prices. Uh, can we use this uh, price data collection to mitigate the bias in the demand study? And then we also are going to like do uh, compare a different price collection method in the field survey. And then from the policy perspective, we want to try to look at what is the effect on areas of policy analysis, like poverty measurement, assessment of marginal tax reform. And then this is our timeline. And then thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Susan and Firman. I, I find it very difficult to comment on this paper. One is because obviously they know what they're talking about. Um, and secondly, uh, Susan's example about the Angus Steakhouse made me think about something else other than the paper, given the time. So, um, so I'm just going to do, do a summary and what I think about the, the paper. So the problem, as uh, Susan and uh, Firman mentioned, is that rural prices are largely unavailable and proxies for rural prices that are currently used are weak. So what we know about conditions in rural areas, you know, poverty rates, impacts of policies, um, maybe inflation, even inflation data is in, inaccurate. So the, the gist is it's very important to get accurate price data. Now the study will collect um, those data using mobile technology approach to be piloted in Nusa Tenggara Barat. And I think it's, uh, it's very important studies because getting rural price data has been difficult. So, you know, if the study can prove getting it in a low cost manner rather than sending surveyors into um, all rural areas in the country works, then it'll be awesome. So uh, some suggestions. I think looking at the slides, there are two purposes of the project. One is to show the government that collecting rural price data is very important. And the second one is to show the government what's the best way to collect data. Now, these two purposes overlap to a certain extent, but the second one is also relevant for urban price data. So maybe, you know, some ideas for the government to change their uh, traditional data collection uh, techniques. Now, to achieve the first purpose, um, to show government that collecting rural price data is important. Uh, I think the paper needs to show the benefits of those data, you know, more accurate poverty measurement, better inflation data, price stabilization um, programs, did that work or not? The key is to show what the government has been missing out on. Um, I'm going to put an, a graph uh, from Jensen, which was mentioned by Susan, and I think it's, it's a very powerful example of how information can make things better. So just a bit of a background, in, in Jensen's study in India, there were about 15 fish markets, I think, on the, on the western coast of India. So details are a bit hazy uh, because I forgot about the paper. Um, but then every morning, um, fishermen came to, to the beach, and then they have to choose which of the 15 markets they have to sell their, their goods to. And, and they don't know, basically, the, the different prices for their uh, uh, fishes in of the in the 15 
market so then mobile phone technology came and then what they can do now is not they have information on all 15 markets or on the whole markets that might potentially pay for their things so this is the impact of information if you look at the, the price of uh, fish here before the introduction of mobile phone you see the huge variation and jensen said that that's that's not very good for the welfare of the fishermen once mobile phone is introduced you can see the impact you know prices um, adjust and variation declines very significantly this is the second uh, region in in india and the impact is the same so this shows the, the causal impact of information which uh, jensen said um, in this uh, particular example improves the welfare of the of the fishermen now if if the government sees something like this and then they can say okay so the the rice sellers or the 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 chili sellers, everyone, they have access information on the prices of each market that they can sell to, then it'll be well for improving. You know, something like that will be a, a powerful uh, incentive for the government to, to take notice of this uh, research. The second one, um, if you want to, you know, show the government if there are better ways of collecting data, you, you have to try several collection methods like you have mentioned. Um, you know, I was thinking, you can vary by mode. You said you want to do discovery, but what about discovery compared to predetermined markets? Uh, you want to vary by intensity. So, you know, you collect just uh, the non-professional collectors. You use them only, which is cheaper than using them plus supervision. Or you use the professional ones like the uh, BPS uh, monthly uh, statisticians, for example. So th these are different intensities that will give you different costs of collecting the same data. Um, you might want to think about different categories of the non-professional um, uh, collectors. You can have traders, you can have high school students, you can have uh, housewives, you know, as a way to improve their income, uh, like Raiden said. Um, you can vary by technology, mobile phones, paper-based things like that. So, you know, all these um, can be in an experiment. Um, and then, of course, you have to compare it to the government's current practice and and show that the alternative ones are better of course one more thing is that the different collection methods should be costed appropriately so the benefits versus cost can be calculated um, and this is important you have to think about government capabilities both human resources time and budget because the idea i i assume that the eventual idea is for government to take over uh, these methods so you know don't suggest approaches that are clearly beyond their capabilities if they, they can only do paper based, then don't tell them to do, you know, Android based uh, CAPI or something. Or Apple, yeah. Uh, and this is just a, a final slide. To influence policy and practice, you need to engage with the target audience very early on. Uh, I didn't see that from your slides, but it's very important. You know, find out what they need, what their current thinking is. So it'll help you refine your project and make it more relevant. Thanks. Very good comments. Um, I'm going to let uh, maybe two or three questions before the uh, presenters. Um, uh, Sarah, maybe? Pa Zulfan? And I think Acho. Oh, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I ask uh, one short and one not too short question? Sorry. Yeah. So the short question is very practical. I'm wondering if you are going to make the data publicly available at some point because uh, it will be very useful. And the second one is that uh, so in rural area, uh, a conventional problem is a lot of households uh, consume what's produced by the household. Uh, so is that an important factor in your area of study? That's it. Yeah, Zulfan, University of Western Sydney. I'm wondering about this uh, other research in other countries, uh, looking at to what extent the rural inflations will be significantly different, inflated or deflate or underestimate or overestimate from the inflation in the respective uh, in the respective urban center. Say, for example, in Lombo, I'm sure that uh, the only source of inflation data or price index is from Mataram. And to what extent that price index in Mataram will be different from the rural data in the Lombok Island. So I'm wondering uh, the outcomes from other countries. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. First, can I abuse my opportunity to let Titi ask? Because it's really cool uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Acho. Uh, last year, there was a call, uh, uh, what is it? Um, Walkathon? Or, uh, the thing is that hackathon, hackathon in last year. So the one of the winner is the Pantau Harga. It's called Pantau Harga or Code for Nation. Uh, so these guys develop application to crowdsourcing uh, to get the, the data. I'm wondering whether your initiative can be collaborated with these guys because they already started uh, last year, I guess. Uh, I think that's my... my and that is by Ainur Najib, the guy behind the Kawal Pemilu thing. And my question, just very quickly, <laughs> I was I was wondering about the forty items in your basket of uh, commodities. Do they include things uh, whose price are administered by the government? Price or other things? Thanks a lot for um, the comments in here. So I think um, so with the Daniel's comments. So we, um, so I believe that probably that uh, if we have enough budget, we are going to like play around with kind of this a different experimenting method here. But for sure, that one way we are going to do it. So the first thing we are going to do the traditional market survey, and then we also are doing the crowdsourcing in here. And then uh, the crowdsourcing is mainly through the directed mode. And then if we're going to like, play around, if there's enough budget, we're also like, going to do a uh, discovery mode by um, the by the our local crowdsourcers as well. And then in terms of I think uh, you're talking about that need to bring the target institution quite early on, that is quite really a fair point. Um, so I'm going to like, spend a few days in Jakarta. I'm so going to probably like, start knocking on the door. So I'm just going to go to BPS, going to the World Bank, and then I'm going to like talk to uh, the people at the UN Global Pass. And then probably I know that they also have crowdsourcing this data at the company in the premise. And then hopefully that we might be able to try to piggy bank with their project. And then hopefully that we might be able um, to uh, lower cost and then increase our samples and then so forth in here. Um, and with the Sarah comment about that data public available, and then obviously said, you know, uh, I think now uh, this is if you like publish the papers, uh, if the papers got accepted that by law that you are supposed to provide the data for the public use as well for the replication purpose. And then if uh, that is not the case, that just email me, then we are happily to uh, make it share the data uh, available for you. And then with the household self-producing items, so that may be a quite a bit problematic, but I'm pretty sure that no matter that where the rural area, so there may be some kind of like traditional market surveys going on in here, so at least we can like try to get what are the prices that they are facing in that particular market, and then that is probably like we need to uh, bear in mind if that is the case, that, that is the market is quite thin, we need to kind of like be uh, doing a change of plan in here. And then with the part, Joe found a comment here about rural inflation here, Unfortunately, that in a lot of the data, a lot of these uh, pilot study that's been going on in other country, so this uh, also like pilot study, so they haven't really done a lot of work uh, try to look at this inflation. They try to look at whether that this is feasible or not. So hopefully that next year when we have our data, we might be able to tell you know, whether that inflation using our data collected by the crowdsourcing is going to be any different from uh, by just using a proxy for the Lombok Island, right? So. Um, the other thing, uh, so thanks to like Bak Titi about uh, telling us about this hackathon. So we just, I'm just going to like, add that on my uh, to knock list when I go to Jakarta. Um, 40 items to consume. So there, the 40 items to consume is just basically that because that we also like want try to link our data with the Susanas. So what we try to do here, we just like, pick at uh, the data from a budget share. So we we are being widely consumed in the people in the Lombok area. And then that is basically how we're going to uh, collect our data uh, from. Yeah. So I think. Yeah. Just a uh, uh, little uh, add a little bit. So so we we are aware in the last few years there's a lot of these hackathons and looking at different things like the flood warning and then prices and and we are going to reach out to those people. The one that we've been talking to is the the, the one in Pulse Lab, which actually look at prices in in NTB. So definitely we'll be talking to them. Uh, I think, the, yeah, I'm 
forgot what I was going to say. Okay, so I want it's, I don't want to stop you for your, from your lunch. Uh, Items in the basket? No. Uh, what? Items in the basket. The last point from Acho. No, that's not the one you wanted to. No, 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 no. no. Okay, then let's go get Angus. <laughs> Thank you so much for excellent presentation and good luck with your uh, study. Um, I don't have funding, but if you need a volunteer, yeah. We'll see, okay. Thank you um, for the discussion, uh, and I give it back to the organizers. We are heading to lunch, I guess, yeah. Uh, as usual, lunch uh, is provided in Koi um, restaurant, and we will, be, we will be back at 2.10. Thank you. Ah, no.